he, he just got back from Haiti with the Fricks and some of the people from this area was in Haiti for uh, uh, a week or so and he was on the way down he was telling me all the stuff they did. So, but he called me this morning and I was already on my way and he said, uh, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Yankton. He said, I'll go along. So I'm glad to have Matt with me today. And uh, we uh, want you to know as a congregation, we're, uh, I'm getting my Bible out here, we're uh, working toward the time when we'll have a new pastor to present to you. And uh, we're going through that process. Uh, thank you for responding to the survey that was handed out and that will help your board and the uh, search committee uh, give them an idea of what you as a congregation are looking for in a pastor and uh, what you believe God wants for you and it, it, in the end we want to hear from God don't we? We want God yeah. to reveal to us as a church uh, just exactly what God desires for us. And, and I'm confident that God has already prepared your next pastor for you. Amen. He, they may not know yet that they're coming to Yankton. Right. <laughs> but God has prepared them. Amen. And uh, this process will reveal not only to you, your pastor, but to your pastor, it will reveal to them the place where they're supposed to serve. So you continue in prayer and in your faithfulness, and God will uh, reveal to you and to them what he has for you. How many here are looking forward to the coming of the Lord? Just wave your hand. Amen. You're just looking forward to the coming of the Lord. Uh, he's coming. He's coming soon. We, we believe that. We look at the times. We look at the age we're in, and we just have an understanding that that time uh, is soon. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that this morning. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. And uh, we'll see that the, the disciples asked him, when, when will this time be? Well, let's look at that. Mark 13, beginning with verse number 1. Then as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here? And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. That's a good word for us today. Don't let anybody deceive you. He said, For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and I and will deceive many. But when you hear of wars and rumors of where wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen. <coughs> These things happen. But the end, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles, and these are the beginnings of sorrows. But watch out for yourself. For they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. In another passage, he says, and then, when the gospel is preached to all nations, and then the end will come. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. He goes on to explain 
many other of those things that will happen during those last days as we wait for his coming. But go down to, to the end of the chapter, Mark 13, to the end of the chapter, chapter and starting again with verse 32. Let me find it here. <clears throat> But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming. In the evening, at midnight, at crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. And so we see a lot of things happening in our world, a lot of troubling things. And it makes us believe that the Lord is coming soon. The disciples wanted to know when the end of time would be. How do you spend your time? How will you live this day, this day of all of these things that are taking place in our world? What will that day look like? We are engulfed in a world that keeps reminding us that the time is short. Time seems to fly by so fast. We, we, we are reminded how we need to manage our, our time better. But then we see so much that we need to do or could do. That even if we had all the time in the world, it would not be enough. Scientists tell us that our universe is expanding and speeding up, so it, all, it sounds like even the cosmos is working against us. There is more and more to explore at the same time. It seems like less time to do it all. Dealing, is, dealing with time is one of the great struggles in life. We begin life as little children with a delightful incomprehension of, of time. Daddy, are we there yet? We get into the car to go on a trip and we would hardly get out of the driveway and it's, are we there yet? When are we going to get there? How soon will we be there? Is the question. When my folks would leave and leave us and leave us with an aunt or a grandma or somebody, they would often play this game with us to let us know when they would come back. And they, maybe it would be five days and they'd say, this is morning, this is afternoon, this is night and morning. And, and we would count on our fingers the days until they would get back. But we had, we had a hard time comprehending time and, and understanding how much time we, we have. We, we, we would, uh, can't wait until it would happen, whatever it would be. Can't wait till Christmas gets here. And uh, we just wondered, when, when, how soon? As we grow older, it seems that time just flies by. How many days, shopping days left at Christmas, we ask? Stressfully. How many hours left to New Year's? I mean, do the countdown to midnight. And then, older still, and our days begin to stretch. We try to fill them, the time between visitors. I, as I retired from my church, I began to work with uh, one of the seniors' uh, places in Sioux Falls. And, and uh, I drive some of them to their destinations for the day. And, and uh, they would often talk to me when they get in the car, you know, about, about uh, being alone. And how life has changed for them. And uh, time between visitors, between meals, the time between the effort to get up and, and the relief of bedtime. Time changes. For many Time is a problem because it is a limited commodity. There was a, a, a book written and a movie uh, based on that book here recently about time, time being the, the uh, used as commerce and, 
You have so much time and you can trade your time. You can give away so many years to get something you would buy with the time you have. And everybody had so much time and they, they, they used it to, to, to buy and to sell and to trade with the time. We have to make choices. One of the great human questions is the question about time. The question is when. We want, we want to know how much time we have. The question is when. What are the deadlines? When was the question the disciples asked? When will this time happen? Jesus tells them to look at these, this beautiful temple and he says, there's coming a day when not one stone will be left upon the other. This building, these buildings will be destroyed. And that's when they say, when? Will there be any signs? Will there be any warnings? How will we know when? And strangely enough, Jesus doesn't give them a countdown. The, the signs are not even good clues. He doesn't say when. His clues are so unclue-like. They are general. He says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And don't be troubled by that because these things must happen. But it's not like as if when you see a war, that's when I'm coming. Earthquakes and famines. Nothing I can't say the word now. <laughs> Nothing really to set your clock by. These were just general kind of things that happened in life. He said these things are going to happen, but he's not saying when that happens, you can the next day I'm coming. He just gives some general things of, that are going to take place in life. And they're happening. They're happening. We look around us and we see them happening. And some people say, oh, Jesus must be coming this year. Back. back. I don't know if you remember back. And some of you don't, weren't even born then. Back in 19, I think it was 1988, there was a guy that wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Christ is Coming in 1988. When were you born at? <laughs> Even before it's bad anymore. Not, and, and he hasn't come yet. And he says here that no one knows the hour, not even the angels, not even the son, not even himself. And so when he, they said, when? He said, are there going to be any signs? And he lists all of these things. And they're still happening. All those things are still taking place. Oh, I believe he's coming sooner. I, I, I have this sense that it's, it's sooner now than ever. But I'm 74. And I've been in the church all my life. And I've been hearing sermons all my life about the coming of the Lord. And sometimes if we got home from school and our parents weren't there, we wondered, did Jesus come? <laughs> Where's my mother? She's supposed to be here. <laughs> he said there'd be wars and earthquakes and famines and plagues. We know that one of those wars brought down that great temple that he was speaking of. And we know today there's still wars and rumors of wars and wars being planned. No age since then to this very day has been without these calamities. And sadly, the time for these to end does not seem near. Jesus here is not predicting the end. This is not a doomsday forecast. He doesn't call his disciples then or today to forecast the end. He calls us, now listen, He calls us to faithfulness. Amen. No matter the day, no matter the circumstance, 
He calls us to live faithful as witnesses of his name and his person. He doesn't tell us when, but he tells us how to live. How to use our time. How to spend our time. Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 8, verse 8. For you once were darkness, but now you are the light. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness and righteousness and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. <laughs> For it is shameful even to speak of those things that are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. And whatever makes manifest is light. But all. Uh, therefore, he says, awake, you who are asleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Walk in wisdom, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming, redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. That is using the time wisely. Because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise. But understand what the will of the Lord is. Using the time you have. To glorify the Lord. None of us know how much time we have left. None of us know. Jesus didn't say, well, you know, you're going to have this much time. And the clock is set, and when the alarm goes off, it's over. But we're to use the time wisely. He wants us to be wise, redeeming the time, understanding the will of God. It is significant that rather than a sign, a lot of people are so concerned about the sign. If we were to give them, if we were to announce to the people of Yankton that the next week we're going to reveal the signs that will tell us when Jesus is coming, we could fill this place. I remember as a kid growing up, there was evangelists that would travel around, and they came to our church, and they had this big, this big chart that spread across the whole width of the front of the building. And throughout the week, he would teach. He started in Genesis, and he took us all the way through to Revelations, and he talked about the dispensations of the Lord. Amen. It was very interesting and very intriguing, and the church was full. <coughs> that was when I was a kid. People, people are so, so interested in the prophetic things. And they want to know about the future. And, and, and those are profitable for us to know. I'm not saying we shouldn't understand. But what I'm saying is, God is concerned about how we use our day. Amen. How we use our time. That we use it profitably for the Lord. And not be so concerned about the end. You see, a lot of people heard about prophetic things and that the Lord was coming. And you know what some of them did? They sold everything. They sold everything, even their clothing. And they got white robes. And they went up and sat on a mountain waiting for the Lord to come and get them. And all the while, down in the valley, there were people that needed to hear a message, needed to see a living witness of the church of Jesus Christ. And they were hiding on a mountain. Because Jesus was coming. Listen, folks. He is coming. I, 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 I want to say one more. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But hear me. He's not asking us to hide away on a mountain in some cave, waiting for him to come, hoping the world doesn't get us in the meantime. He's wanting us to redeem the time, to use the time profitably. Not forecasting, but faithfulness. 
Jesus confronts our fears with living in dangerous times. He does not tell us that we'll be rescued from these. Rather, he sends us out to serve in a suffering world. We're to go out into a suffering world with the hope, with the word of hope, that a loving God will now not allow suffering to have the last word. Jesus gives us signs, things to watch out for, not because they help us predict how long we have, but to tell us there is no more important day than this day in which to serve the Lord. Sadly, too many times the church has, has seen these signs and they've gone off and hid. All the while their neighbors and family members were speeding headlong into eternity blind and lost. These signs remind us that there is a need for a vibrant church, for a spirit-filled witness in this day of trouble and suffering. And word and fretting, you and I, the church of Jesus Christ, should be a church and a people filled with the joy of God and a peace that passes all understanding. You shouldn't be pacing back and forth, fretting about the tomorrows. Say, what are we going to do? Who are we going to elect? What's going to come of us? What will Trump be able to achieve in, in Korea? What, what's going to take place in Iraq? That's not our worry. Yeah. Yeah. We have to be alive, five with people in this world without a hope. We are to be the hope. We, we are not to live in darkness, but we are to live in, in light. We are to be the light. Right. In this dark world. We are the ones this day that can bring to our hurting and suffering world, suffering from war and disease and confusion and poverty and natural disaster and the breakup of families. Jesus gives us signs, not for predicting, not for forecasting, but to show us where God needs us to be. Matthew on the way down here was talking to me about their Haiti trip and, and what's going on. He's gone on a few trips to Haiti. To the same place where a young woman uh, from South Dakota, Iowa, went to Haiti for a three-month mission. And that's been how many years, Matthew? Thirteen years. She's still there. Amen. And she built a church where there was nothing. She went to a land that they had taken off all the trees to, to just to live by. And it was barren. And they were living in mud huts. Now they're living in homes. Now there's a school and a university and a church and a hospital, or at least a, a medical care place. Where the, there were how many, uh, how many witch doctors, man? Uh, 31. 31 witch doctors. Now they're members of her church. <laughs> Amen. See, the church is to go out there where there's suffering and poverty and, and worry and fear and trouble and sickness. And they come with a message of the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings hope. We don't run off and hide and wait for Jesus to come. But he's saying, here is the thing you're to do. It's how you spend your day. Amen. Oh, I want Jesus to come. But let me ask you a question. If Jesus came this very day, this very hour, and the church was taken, let me ask you this question. How many of you have relatives that would be left behind? How many of you have best friends, co-workers, neighbors that would be left behind? You see, why doesn't Jesus, he, he tarries because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He tarries because he gave his church an assignment to take the gospel of Jesus Christ into all the world, to every tribe, every language, to every nation. And he said, then, then, when we complete our assignment, then he will come. If you're looking for a sign, the sign is 
when the church has completed her task. And so he says, redeem the time. Spend the time. How are you spending your time? Spend it wisely doing the things of God. If you knew, if you knew, if God gave you a message and we knew, if he came to a church and he said, listen, I'm going to give you one more week. Just one more, I'm going to give Then it's all, all going to be over. How would you spend that week? How would you spend that week? But you be on the phone calling people saying, Jesus is coming. He's coming before the week is over. You've got to give your heart to Jesus. But you're knocking on doors, saying, listen to me, the Lord Jesus is coming. He's coming in a week. See, we don't know when, but we do know that we have a job. We have an assignment. We're not predicting when, but we're to walk faithfully. Jesus tells his followers then and now, in the midst of these things that happen, do not be alarmed, do not be terrified. Don't fill your times with anxiety and fear. Listen to Daniel chapter 12, first three verses. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over, watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was seen since that there was a nation. Even at that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awaken, some to everlasting life, and some to shame. And everlasting contempt. You see, there is eternal life for everybody. Some it will be with Christ in glory, and others will be in eternal damnation. Lost. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like, like the stars forever and ever. He wants us to be wise and to shine. We have nothing to fear. This is our day to shine, a time to be faithful. We can be aware. Remembering God holds the future. What does the future hold besides wars and earthquakes and famine? Are these endless? Will every age no pain? Does time just march on and on and on, bringing us so much sorrow? No. God holds the future, and Daniel gives to us a glimpse. The wise shall shine like many stars. Those who lead many to righteousness shall shine forever. God says in Hebrews, I will forgive them their sins and will remember them no more. It's a generous, loving God full of mercy who holds the time, who holds the future, all of our time, all of our days. So we need, need not be fearful. To live every day, as, but to live every day as if every day mattered. Not because it might be your last, but because God holds the last in every day till then. We can live as if this is the most important day of our lives. This day. Because it's a precious gift from God. An opportunity to show His love. Not fear. To be aware. Not alarmed. How do you spend your time? How will you live this day? I hope you'll live this day and every day knowing that God holds them all. And He holds you. James 4, 13 to 17 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. 
But how do you boast of your arrogance all such boasting is evil? Therefore to him, listen to this now, therefore to him to do good. And does it not to him it is said. For him to do good, to know to do good, and you don't do it. You say, well, I, Pastor, I, I, I don't. I don't commit sin. We used to have this little jingle we'd say. I, I don't smoke or drink or go with go girls who do. I didn't quite get that right, but you got the idea. <laughs> you know, what is your list of sin? I don't do those. I don't do those. It's not about, it's not about what you don't do. It's about what you do do. See? To know to do good and not do it is sin. The, the Bible tells us that each one of us, each one of us, even while we were in our mother's womb, that he, that he created you he created you for good works. And it goes on to say, and he created good works for you to do. Think about that. Even before you were born, he had a destiny in mind for you. He had a mission in mind. He created you for a purpose. And then he created the good works for you to do. What an opportunity to fulfill his holy purpose in your life. An assignment. He had, he had good works for you. Have you ever thought about what that good work is that God created for you? You know, don't try to think about that. It'll hurt you. It'll hurt your brain. <laughs> but seek every day. Seek every day to be full of the Spirit and to walk faithfully before the Lord. He told his disciples, e -e even if you get arrested and you're called to trial, don't worry about what you're going to say. Just say what he gives you to say at that moment. Amen. You see, there's a lot of people who this church is a Pentecostal church. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And that sounds like a strange thing. But he says, he said that we would, that he would give to us an utterance and we would speak it. You know, that's what happens. A lot of people, when they come to that moment of receiving the baptism and speaking of the, they kind of go like this. They're, they're praising the Lord and they, they feel all anointed. And, they, and all of a sudden they go like this. And they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to somehow get a hold of their tongue and speak. Amen. But that doesn't, that's not how it works. He says, they spoke. God gave them an utterance. They spoke. And that sounds kind of strange, but you know what? I have found myself many times speaking what God gave me to speak in English. He put that words here. And sometimes in a counseling situation or in a witness situation, I, I, I people come into my office and they came with all kinds of trouble. And and I and I and I'm not I'm not a I'm not a trained psychiatrist. All of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to them and I'm listening to what I'm saying and I'm saying, Mom, when did you get so smart? <laughs> when did you get so wise? What's happening? The Holy Spirit's given me an utterance and I'm speaking. Amen. And he wanted you to learn that with the speaking in tongues, that you would surrender yourself to speak whatever the Holy Spirit gives you to speak. That's, right. That's what it's about, friends. And he wants us to live. You can have a schedule for your day. I have this phone has my calendar and I can look up, okay, here's what I got going. And, and then I go. And 
suddenly I find myself, it wasn't on the schedule, but I find myself in a, in a situation where suddenly I'm there, God created a work for me, and here I am doing it. Uh, I got into the van at Good Samaritan one day where I was working at and I retired. I, I found out that I, I, Matthew, I don't have as much time to play golf now that I'm retired as I used to have when I was working. I, I do this often, what I'm doing here with you. And then I work some days at Good Samaritan, and I work some days at First Assembly in Sioux Falls, visiting people who can't get to church. And, and then some days my wife wants me to work for her. <laughs> <laughs> but one day I was there in the van, and this lady got into my into my van, and uh, she I had taken her to a doctor, and, and I could tell that she was all crippled up. She had a walker, and she, she was all bent over. And she got back into the van, and she had a little bit of a struggle to get in there, and we began to talk. As I would take her, and this became a regular thing every week, Thursdays and Fridays, the days I worked, I had her in my van every week, and I would take her back and forth, and I began to talk to her about the Lord. And I would say to her something some like, well, the Apostle Paul said, later on I found out she said, well, you were talking about the Apostle Paul, and I didn't even know who the Apostle Paul was. <laughs> she was Catholic, but she just never went to church. We began to talk. One day the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night and said, this day when you see Mary Ann, I want you to tell her something that I, I'm going to give you a message for Mary Ann. I want you to tell her this. So she got into my van that day. After we got by, we talked about the weather and the day. But I said, you know what, Mary Ann, God last night woke me up and he wanted me to tell you something. And she looked at me like as if what are you saying? That God woke you up so you could tell me something? God wants you to tell me something? I said, yeah, God wanted me, wanted me to tell you that he knows all about your need and all about your trouble and he loves you. And he has a future for you. And she was just all. <coughs> And over the months, we talked a lot. She didn't ask me, well, I have a Bible, but I can't understand it. Is there one that I might be able to understand a little better? How to find a Bible that she could read that was easier. And then she got into a neighborhood Bible study there on the campus. And she started watching gospel television. She asked me about that. I directed her to some, some church services on television that, she, that I knew were preaching the gospel that she could listen to. And then one day she wasn't there. I said, where's Mary Ann? They said, she went to hospice. I said, hospice? I couldn't believe it. Because you go to hospice to die. And uh, I made my way over to that hospice room on Saturday. And I, all the way over there, I prayed, God, let me have Mary Ann all by myself. And I got there, her three sons were in the room. And I introduced myself. And she said, as I walked into the room, she said, oh, Ron, I prayed that you would come. And I introduced myself to her sons. I was one of her drivers, and I'm a retired pastor. And they said, well, why don't you sit down and visit with her? We'll go get a cup of coffee. They were kind of glad to get out of there, I think. I was glad for them to leave. <laughs> and Mary Ann said to me, Ron, I'm ready. I said, you're ready, Mary Ann? What does that mean to you? She said, well, I, this one, I, I know you won't take me until I'm ready. She had kind of a purgatory idea. And I said, Mary Ann, you could be ready today. Right now, in this room, right now, you could be ready. 
You can take your last breath here and your next breath in the presence of Jesus. You can take your last step here and you can take the next step with Jesus. Would you like that? Would you, you say, oh, yes. I said, would you pray a prayer with me? And I led her a sinner's prayer. She received Christ into her heart. You know, I've been a pastor for 50 years. Most of the time, I just hung out with the church people. And, 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 and those, those years have been so refreshing to me. I, I kind of, I kind of, kind of get what, what you folks have. I get to hang out with sinners and talk to them about the Lord. And, and I, 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 I want to encourage you to just go every day to work, every day to school, every day into your community with this, with this thought, Jesus, you're going to send me someday, this day, to some person who needs to hear from you. And you're sending me to them. Let me be available to speak for you. When, Jesus? He says, right now. Right now. It's not about when I come. It's about you're here now. And I'm sending you to a people that need you. To the suffering, hurting, blind, searching, hungry. They don't even eat. They don't even know they're lost. They don't even know they're Dying without God. But I'm sending them to you. As long as it is today, Hebrew 3 warns us, as long as it is today, as long as it is today, as long as it is called today, we have this day a gift from God to serve him faithfully, saying, this is the day the Lord has made. One of my favorite passages Bible. I often begin my day with that. This is the day the Lord has made. And it's not about whether it's raining or sunshine. It has nothing to do with the weather. But the day the Lord has made, a day for me to serve Him. It's the day the Lord has made. And I'll rejoice and be glad in it. I'm not going to grumble my way through the day and say, oh, it's cloudy. I wish it would stop raining. It's snowing some more. It's too hot. <laughs> no, it has nothing. Oh, this is a beautiful day. No, it has nothing to do with that. It has to, it has to do with the fact that this is a day the Lord has made for you. Amen. To serve Him. To shine like the stars. Look around you. Instead of seeing signs of the end is so bad God's got to come to deliver me out of this. Instead, see opportunities for you to shine like the stars, to be wise, to redeem the time, to bring the good news to some suffering soul. See also that this is the day of salvation. Do not put off until today. One day, I was pastoring my first church. <clears throat> Little town of 300 people. I took my wife there. Our son had just been born. And uh, she was kind of upset with me that I took her to such a small town. We had lived in big cities, Detroit, Minneapolis. And now I'm in this little town, Tuscola, Michigan. 300 people. And uh, she said to me, I'm going to take Ronnie and I son out for a walk in the in the buggy and uh, she was gone about 10 minutes and she's back see you back already she said i just walked through the whole town <laughs> <laughs> one day a man that lived down in the corner by the gas station it was the gas station it was the post office it was what groceries you could buy in that town was in that book. That was it. That was the city. That was the commercial center. There was a man that lived next door there. Uh, he had visited our church. And someone told me he was in the hospital. So I made my way to the hospital to see him. He had had uh, 
surgery. It wasn't any life-threatening kind of thing. He had surgery. And then I heard he came home. And I had this urge to go visit him. And it, but it was already evening. When I heard it was home, I said, well, I'll, I'll go in the morning. In the night time, an ambulance came to our little town. Picked up that man, he had died. I heard about it in the morning. They died in the night. And I thought, Lord, you, you spoke to me about going to see him last night. Spend it wisely. Are you going to be obedient to the Lord? Are you just living your days hoping Jesus will come and get me out of here? Or are you going to look around and say, there's some people that need me. God wants me to shine like the star. He wants me to use my days wisely to redeem the time, not to waste it, but to wisely live for Him every day. Every day. Every day. Why don't you bow your heads? And I want to speak to anybody that might be in this room today. And you don't know for sure if you are ready for the coming of the Lord. Maybe there's somebody here right now that would raise a hand and say, Pastor, I, I, I don't think I'm ready to meet Jesus. This were my last day. I don't think I'm ready. I, I, I don't mean to bring fear to you. I'm trying to bring hope to you. In all likelihood, this isn't your last day. But we don't know that. But I wonder if there's somebody here that would raise hand and say, Pastor, I need, I want to know for sure. I want to receive Christ as my Savior. And it's very easy to do with the Bible says if you if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that He died on the cross for you and rose again on the third day, if you believe that in your heart, and confess that with your mouth, you get the free gift of eternal life. It's that simple. I said that to Mary Ann. She believed it. She prayed that prayer. She confessed that faith with her mouth. And the rest of her days, she was rejoicing in her salvation. I wonder if there's someone today that would raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I need Jesus. I'm not sure, but I'd like to be sure today. Is there anyone? Yes, God bless you. Thank you for raising your hand. Is there anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else at all? I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'd like you to repeat the prayer. I want all of you to repeat it. Along with this one that raised your hand. I'd like you all, maybe there's someone sitting next to you that didn't have courage to raise their hand, but they want to, and they'll pray when you pray. So let's repeat this prayer. Dear Jesus, 
I believe that you are God's son. The only way to the Father. I believe that you're my Savior. Because I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I need a Savior. I believe you died on the cross for me. And that you will forgive me all my sin. And never remember it again against me. I believe you rose on the third day. Victorious over death. Over sin. Over Satan. You rose to give me life. And that more abundantly. I believe all of that in my heart. And today I confess I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I ask you to forgive me all my sin. And I believe you heard me now. And that I'm forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today and you believe it, the Bible says you, you just received the free gift of eternal life. I wonder, I'm going to ask you another question. I'm going to ask you to think right now about one person one person that you know, it might be a relative, it might be a neighbor, it might be a co-worker. You, 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 you can think of a hundred names probably, but I'm only asking you to think about one right now. And I'm going to ask you to ask God to help you to somehow bring that one person the saving news of Jesus Christ that they would hear it and believe it in their heart and confess it with their mouth and have a free gift of eternal life. Now I want you to pray this prayer with me and I want you to name the person who gets that moment. Just name that person. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you have given me the free gift of eternal life. I thank you that your Holy Spirit has come to dwell in me. And I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. I thank you that you have given me the, the power to speak life. You want me to be a shining star in the life of name the person. I ask you to give me opportunity to speak to name the person. To live before them. And to see them receive you as their Savior. Help me to be faithful not to sin against the opportunity, but to redeem that opportunity, to spend that opportunity wisely. I promise you today that I will strive to be faithful and to use the opportunity you give me. In Jesus' name. Lord, you've heard these people pray. Now I pray for all of those names that were mentioned. I know that you're not willing that they should perish. And that's why you have given us to them. You want us to stand between them and eternal heaven. Lord, I, I pray that those opportunities will come quickly. They will see that opportunity stand before them and they'll have the courage to obediently speak the utterance you give them. Thank you, Jesus, that many will come to know you as a result of that prayer this day. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. In Jesus' name.
As you leave this place today, go rejoicing in this day. Say it with me. This is the day. The Lord has made. And I will rejoice. And be glad in it. Amen. Amen.